So I came to Harvard Law School in 1978. I had never met a lawyer before. I knew nothing about the practice of law. So my reasons for attending law school were not particularly well informed. But I had always had a craving for academic rigor. I had never experienced it before. College was a dud. Um, public schools, frankly, were a dud. And I really, really wanted one time in my life where I would be in the midst of inspiring professors, brilliant students, really trying to, together, go after true intellectual inquiry. Frankly, the other reason I came to Harvard Law School is because I wanted to postpone, by three more years, entry into the world of responsible adulthood because I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up and I wanted three more years to consider my options. But my time at Harvard Law School was invaluable. I did meet those brilliant and inspiring professors and classmates and they helped me foster a lifelong interest in fairness and a devotion to social justice and human rights. And they also helped develop lifelong friendships, including friendship with a man who became my husband, John Savarese. But as I remember, as a 1L, early on I conducted an informal survey among my classmates, asking them why they decided to come to law school. And I remember being surprised at how many of them confided that they actually had, would have preferred pursuing something different, and often in the arts. There were those who wanted to be poets and novelists, musicians, painters, playwrights, actors, professional athletes even. But like me, they concluded that they lacked the talent to pursue these ambitions, and so they fell back on law as a more viable alternative. And in hindsight, it's not surprising to me that my classmates had an interest in the arts, and that many practicing lawyers I've met are frustrated artists of one kind or another. And I've known a number of people like myself who went from practicing law to pursuing art, especially in their later years. And it's not surprising because successful lawyering requires artistry. Thespian talent is required to be a great litigator, a great law professor, a high-stakes negotiator, and successful persuasion, which is the essence of lawyering, requires empathy and appreciation for subtle nuance, a mastery of language, lots of creative thinking, and those are attributes that an artist requires to succeed as well. But it took me over half a century to figure out that art was my occupation that would give me deep pleasure. As a corporate lawyer, and a volunteer human rights lawyer, I had found my work often interesting, even exhilarating, often rewarding, often meaningful, but I never found a niche within the practice of law that fit as well as I wanted it to fit. I don't love the office experience. I don't like office clothes. I don't like office politics. I don't like office social hierarchies. I don't like fluorescent lighting. I don't like desks and chairs and conference rooms and copying machines and phones ringing. I much prefer to be outside walking around wearing anything I please. And I also have difficulty relinquishing control of my time and my work product to others, especially senior partners and demanding clients. I found my calling as an artist and a photographer only four years ago. I had always owned fancy cameras, and I liked taking pictures, but I was never pleased with my results. So I went to a beginning photography class at a local Y, and I learned the rudiments of photography. Shifting from the automatic setting on my camera to the manual setting on my camera was life-altering. As I developed proficiency, I became increasingly thrilled at what an amazing toy and tool my camera became. It literally was like putting on a magic pair of glasses. I saw the world anew in a way that I had never seen it before, 
and it was amazing, and I couldn't get enough, and I became obsessed, and I have remained so, and I easily spend 10 to 15 hours a day every day on my photography, and I like everything about the experience, the adventure of stalking and capturing an image, and the thrill of accidental images, and manipulating and editing and recomposing images so that they're pleasing to me, and the joy and the satisfaction that comes from honoring, commemorating, preserving a moment, a place, a person, a scene, and the curatorial editing experience, and the gamble when I exhibit my work. Will my images resonate for others? Will they have meaning for others? Given that I took it up only four years ago, it's still something of a surprise to be able to call myself a professional photographer, but it is, in fact, an appropriate title. At one art fair this past summer in the Hamptons, I sold an astonishing number of prints. I can't tell you how much money I earned because it's still shocking to me. But I've had my work exhibited around the world in both solo and group exhibitions, in art galleries in Vienna, Austria, Houston, Texas, New York City, Brussels, my art has appeared in fine arts magazines in Germany and China and in high-end coffee table design books. Portraits of mine have appeared in Vogue magazine, The Village Voice, book jacket covers, countless digital magazines. I've won prestigious awards and I've been invited to take on commissions of all types. From the beginning, I've pursued many photography projects simultaneously, but mostly along two different paths fine art photography, and social justice photography. My principal social justice project is called the New Abolitionist Campaign, which I co-founded four years ago with a longtime human rights lawyer. She and I were frustrated that the New York State Assembly repeatedly failed to pass important legislation designed to combat human trafficking. After three years of failing to get this legislation passed, we came up with a campaign to more effectively influence them. We wanted to demonstrate to them that there was broader based and deeper based support for this legislation than they realized, and to remind them that there were real people suffering profoundly as a result of their failure to act. And so we came up with this creative photography project. I went out and I photographed 50 individuals, formal portraits, to demonstrate the diversity, breadth, and depth of a community called New Abolitionists that wanted to combat trafficking. My first New Abolitionist was Cy Vance, the Manhattan District Attorney, who, whose office, who, who created the first anti-trafficking unit in his office. And then I met and photographed others in the front lines who fought trafficking and provided help to survivors, social workers, doctors, police, judges, religious leaders, as well as prominent individuals willing to lend their public stature to help raise awareness. And I photographed survivors of human trafficking themselves. And we made a book of these portraits, their bios, their personal statements, and we put a copy of the book in the hands of every member of the New York State Assembly. And the next time the legislation was up for consideration, it passed unanimously. Now, obviously, my book, our book, didn't accomplish that all by itself. But it had an effect. We could feel it. So we decided to continue to expand our new abolitionist community, make it broader, deeper, more diverse, more powerful. So we enlisted actors like Tina Fey, Meryl Streep, Liam Neeson, Lin-Manuel Miranda, and we recruited political leaders like President Jimmy Carter, Senator Schumer, Gillibrand, Congressman John Lewis, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, Mayors Bloomberg and Dinkins, Ambassador Samantha Power, and we recruited activists like Gloria Steinem and Ford Foundation President Darren Walker. And we recruited scholars like Larry Tribe and Charles Ogletree and Orlando Patterson. But the heart and the soul of the campaign are the survivors of human trafficking. And their stories are the most compelling and powerful of all. 
And so I've traveled across the country several times meeting and photographing over 70 survivors of human trafficking now. Young girls and older women, young men and older men, and their stories are invariably heart-wrenching. Their scars are often visible. Their bravery in overcoming their trauma to speak out against trafficking is always deeply moving. And we have over 250 new abolitionists now. And we exhibit their portraits in a variety of strategic venues. Harvard Law School hosted an exhibition and a panel discussion featuring our new abolitionists. We also um, presented them at a national judiciary conference to address human trafficking with the chief justices of over almost half of the country's state supreme courts in attendance. And we had an exhibition at Photoville, one of the largest art fairs in the country. And 75,000 people walked through our booth and saw our abolitionists and picked up our literature on trafficking. I learned that photography turns out to be a very powerful social tool for justice, a social justice too. But for many young people today, photography is a principal means of communication. The proliferation of selfies, postings on social media, having news fed to them in the form of photos and video clips. And given photography's predominance as a means of communication, there are some people who think photography should be taught alongside classes on grammar, teaching people photographic technique and composition, but also exploring the ethical questions that photography raises. Manipulation of reality, invasion of privacy, portrayals that can feel like violations or can be profoundly misleading. My fine arts projects, on the other hand, are a great escape from the intense mission of social justice photography and the weightier ethical considerations of documentary photography. Mostly with my fine arts photography, I'm striving to create a sense of wonder, curiosity, emotional resonance. Fine arts projects like social justice projects take me on great adventures. I often meet a variety of incredibly interesting people along the way, but the projects tend to be deeply and uniquely personal. And that image over there, it looks like a wave. That image is um, from Iguazu Falls, and I call it Cusp. And it was taken while I was standing on the top of one of the world's most colossal waterfalls on the border of Argentina and Brazil. I have other images in a series that show the sort of incredible, colossal magnitude of the falls. But this particular image is at the very top. And for a moment, the water is just poised and, and still. It's almost like a zen-like moment. It's almost like Kawaga Kawagawa's The Great Wave. But what I especially like about it, if you notice that little bit of green grass in the wave, and to me, that is just such an audacious, defiant bit of life because it's getting pummeled with literally hundreds of tons of water every day. And it not only survives, it thrives. And I identify heavily with that little green grass, bit of grass. And the image is also meaningful to me because it was, um, it won the first major international prize that I've had the, the privilege of winning. So that's my story.